Uh, today's panel will be moderated by Ari Schwartz of the Center for Democracy and Technology. Ari is um, leading the anti-spyware coalition and as well as his other activities with regard to privacy at the Center for Democracy and Technology, of which he's a deputy director. So Ari, please take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel here today. Um, let me uh, first go through uh, the names of the panelists and then we'll uh, kick things off uh, with a short presentation uh, before we get into our discussion. The, I'll, I'll, st I'll start from the end there uh, rather than go through alphabetically. The bios are available online for people that want to go into more depth about uh, where w people came from and, and their background. I'm just going to give a, a general uh, introduction to where people are today. Uh, Lord Toby Harris is to uh, our far, uh, I guess it's your far left over there, uh, and he is the chairman of the All Parley Party Parliamentary Group on Policing and also a member of the Select Committee of Investigation, uh, investigating personal internet security, is that correct? And uh, as well as many other uh, segments within the UK Parliament. Uh, next, uh, we have Chris Painter, and Chris is Deputy Chief of Computer Crime, the Computer Crime Section at the Department of Justice. And Chris will be uh, giving the presentation that I mentioned earlier. Uh, next, we have Scott Charney, who is a Vice President of Trustworthy Computing at Microsoft. And uh, closest to me, we have Chris Young, who is the Vice President and General Manager of Consumer Solution, the Consumer Solutions Business Unit at RSA. Uh, Chris, why don't you start off? All right, well, I've been asked to uh, give a little setup by uh, talking about maybe a couple of examples that would uh, provide the anatomy of a cybercrime. And that's kind of a difficult uh, thing to do because the anatomy of cybercrime is a little bit like saying the anatomy of life on Earth. It is, it is completely changing. It is stunning in its variety. Uh, and it all shares one common aspect, that a computer, just like life on Earth, has carbon as its major uh, commonality. Uh, but beyond that, there's such a variety, it's hard to do. But I thought I'd, I'd have a go at that and, and come up with a couple of examples. And so uh, let me begin using my Twilight Zone vo voice. Uh, imagine, if you will, a man sitting in his room, sitting in his house. Say he's in Eastern Europe. We'll call that man Ari. Uh, Ari is sitting there and he's sending out hundreds and hundreds and thousands of emails to people around the world. Uh, and those emails are well crafted. Those emails pretend to be from those people's financial institutions, claiming that there is a problem with their account, there's a security issue, there's something they need to do. And those people are asked to click on a link to go to a website where they can enter some data and clear this whole thing up. You click on the link, you go to a website that looks very, very much like the financial institution's actual page, but in fact is not, and you're asked to enter a bunch of information, personal information, your password information, maybe some account information, uh, and that information is uh, then harvested by Ari because he's controlling that web server where that website is, and he's getting all that information. Now, even if you don't do that, and, and by the way, something like 5% of the people, and this is like casting a wide net where you send hundreds of thousands of emails out, something like 5% of the people actually do buy this. And so there, there's a pretty high, uh, if you think about the number that go out, a pretty high acceptance rate. Even if you don't do that, if you simply click on the link, another thing may happen because Ari is a fairly sophisticated guy and he's going to also have on his system or his little scheme a Trojan that's going to, uh, some malicious code that's going to download to your system and it's going to implant on your system essentially a keystroke logger, a logger that captures information, whether you know it or not, uh, that it can include your password information, again, your account information every time you go into your actual banking's website. And then that information could be retrieved, or it could automatically be mailed to Ari, where he is in Eastern Europe, or it could be mailed to another drop site that he's maintaining, say, in, I don't know, the UK, where he can go and get that. So that's Ari. Ari is harvesting the, all the information. He wants to use it for identity theft. He wants to use it for uh, credit card fraud. There's a lot of things he can do with that. He's on the front end. Now let's take another individual sitting in his room in Brooklyn. I actually would like to expand your, your question a little bit. I know that you're focused on the states, but 
So I would say states and local uh, governments and law enforcement, what role can they play? Because I, I think that uh, the role of, of local law enforcement has come up too. I mean, I think on the state side, there's been a lot of activity. Uh, out of the state of New York uh, that has a cybersecurity agency headed up by a guy named Will Pelgrin, uh, he has started what's called a multi-state ISAC, uh, Information Sharing Advisory Council. And he, and he and his group have really tried to pull the states together to think about these issues in some organized way and, and exchange information with the federal level, with DHS, with us and others, and try to band together. When we had the, the big cyber exercise, Cyberstorm, it was, caused, uh, it was called, the state, both international partners and the states played very much in that. So that's, that's critical. Law enforcement, it's the same thing. One of the issues is getting local law enforcement, when you have these crimes that are multi-jurisdictional, especially multi-jurisdictional in the U.S. and then international, it's hard for a local law enforcement unit to deal with those crimes on their own because they're getting evidence from other jurisdictions. And a lot of times what we try to do is band together in task forces. The Secret Service has task forces, the FBI has task forces around the country, and there are some, there are some good institutional models. So there's something called the Internet Crime Complaint Center that allows people to aggregate a lot of these smaller crimes from local jurisdictions, package them, and try to get them to the state and locals. It's a challenge, though. Everyone, is, everyone has issues of training, resources, how, how they follow these crimes. Uh, it's an evolving thing, but I think there's some pretty good stuff out there. Scott, can you talk a little bit about how you work with AGs as well? That's yes, so you know, states have a huge role to play in a variety of ways. Um, everything from educational roles to law enforcement roles. Some of the challenge goes back to the question we raised internationally about applying sovereign laws in a sovereign agnostic internet. I mean, one of the things that Microsoft has actually been promoting is federal privacy legislation, in part to avoid patchwork laws across the 50 states that makes compliance more difficult. And, you know, there are times when you have to figure out is this the right thing for state and local action, or is this the right thing for federal action, or is this right, the right thing for international action? Um, but we've worked with the AGs a lot on all sorts of things related to um, fraud prevention, um, related to identity theft work, related to parental controls and helping parents keep their children safe as they have their online experiences. And you know, having a close connection to local communities is critically important so that you can reach the right constituencies and make a difference. Any other comments on state and local? We did have a state, we had a, I mean, this is back now six years ago at Stanford, there was uh, the, uh, the conference of all the state IG, or AGs dealing with the cybercrime issue. And since that time, and you know, there were, some of them were fairly new to it at that time. Since that time, the AG community has developed a lot of expertise in this area has developed cybercrime expertise, and they send out newsletters, they do other things. So they do a lot of work in this area, and they work very well with us. So I think that's something we're just going to see across the board. I think, as Lord Toby said, we have some new crimes. I would say, I would differ from you a little and say there are some new crimes attacking infrastructures. That's new. That didn't really happen before. But almost everything is moving to a cyber realm, and you need to reach down to that level to make sure that everyone is engaged. But that's going to require, uh, and it's, it's true in the, the UK, I'm sure it's true in the US, that's going to require a very substantial changing of the skill set of the law enforcement agencies. Um, this is not traditional law enforcement. This is now law enforcement in a new context, in a new environment, where things are changing very rapidly. And the nature of these things is that it's actually uh, the, the institutions aren't very well geared up to responding quickly. So, you know, one message I have very strongly from all of this is whatever structures you set up have got to be able to change quickly to reflect the speed with which technology is changing, and therefore the speed with which people are exploiting it for the purposes of crime. Well, that's an excellent point to stop. And uh, before we thank the panelists, let me first read to people where the next panels are um, so that they know where to go, because we're in breakout sessions here, and I've been told to do this. Um, marketing privacy is in the Concord Lexington room. Uh, Can green energy save the internet is in the Columbia A room. And patents, a look ahead to the future is in the Columbia B room. Uh, so uh, you should be able to find your way. They're all on this floor. Uh, now, if you join me in thanking the panelists, I would really appreciate it. You did a great job.